Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Weaving Worlds. So a while back, I published a video that got a little attention, entitled 13 Ways to Design a Truly Alien Planet. The goal of that video was to show people that a setting that involves outer space has a lot more to offer than just single biome planets that otherwise have an Earth-like gravity, an Earth-like atmosphere, and an Earth-like sense of day and night. However, some commenters on that video have said that I did not yet go far enough, and that any small rocky planet in the Goldilocks zone is still too Earth-like. Life, or something equivalent to life, could hypothetically exist without the presence of liquid water. And even if it couldn't, why should a speculative fiction author let a little thing like reality stop them? Well, let me just say that your point is well received. And I agree that an outer space setting does not need to focus exclusively on rocky planets and simple spacecraft. Setting creators can and have gone much bigger and wilder, and the following nine suggestions should give you some idea of how to use other stellar bodies as more than just decorations. Gas Giants A lot of science fiction authors have speculated over the years about whether gas giants could sustain an alternate form of life pretty much ever since we discovered what gas giants were and what they were composed of. Isaac Asimov wrote a short story about robots that visit a warlike species that lives on Jupiter, and in David Brin's Uplift setting, he mentions that life in the known galaxies is generally divided between oxygen breathers who live on rocky planets and hydrogen breathers who live on gas giants. Even Star Wars features Cloud City, a gas mining installation that floats through the layers of a gas giant. The biggest issue with gas giants is that, even today, no one is quite certain whether they have a surface or how that surface would behave if it existed. We do know that gas giants have several layers, just like Earth and other rocky planets. We do know that at a certain point, the gravity and pressure of a gas giant causes its hydrogen atmosphere to condense into liquid and solid forms, and we know that this transition is gradual. But whether there's any sort of space where self-replicating chemical chains can appear and maintain themselves, that's an open question at best. But if there was any sort of life that could exist on a gas giant, it would probably survive on the convection heat coming up from the core and live in a hydrogen ocean. Of course, all of that only applies if you care about the science. If you don't, the surface of a gas giant could resemble whatever it is you want it to resemble. I recently wrote a fantasy book, Sky Flight, that takes place on a planet that resembles a gas giant but contains layers of Earth-like atmosphere and flying islands that float above an unknown core. You could also have hydrogen-breathing aliens like in the Uplift universe, or you could have gas giants with breathable air like in Star Wars. There's really a lot you can do when it comes to huge planets. Stars In the first book of David Brin's Uplift trilogy, Sun Diver, the protagonist goes on an expedition that discovers not one, but two independent life forms that live in the sun's upper layers. Nothing about them resembles oxygen-breathing life, but they do still have a certain intelligence to them, and the protagonists are able to use psychic energy to connect to them. In Olaf Stapledon's Star Maker, the collective races of the Milky Way discover that all stars everywhere are actually singular living beings and when they try to tap energy directly from stars, it results in a war that accelerates the heat death of the universe. Stars are an unusual place to find living beings, mostly because stars are far too hot to allow anything to exist, aside from fusion and the byproducts of fusion. But at the same time, the sun and the stars are central figures when it comes to mythology and the imagination. Every polytheistic religion in the world has a god of the sun. And while they aren't always the leader of the gods, they are always important. Thus, while it makes no scientific sense for living creatures to survive on stars, or for stars themselves to be alive, there is a strong psychological reason to connect stars with life. Comets and Asteroids In the album 01011001, which is the binary code for Y, the beings of the planet Y seed their genetic code onto a comet that's traveling the Migrator Trail, a mystical path that crosses the entire universe. They then drop this comet onto planet Earth, thus causing the fifth extinction and leading to the rise of hominids. Comets are nothing but wandering balls of ice and frozen gases, and it's even less likely that they could support native life forms or evolution than gas giants or stars. 
Still, you can use them in your setting by turning them into vehicles, into delivery devices that start or end life on planets. Or you can use them as the hosts of mining towns that collect ice and gas for more traditional life forms. You could also go the star route and personify them. Maybe in your setting, comets are alive in some sense, and they actively influence the destiny of the planets they visit, just like how humans thought they did back before they were fully understood. As for asteroids, they are identical to comets, at least as far as their literary utility goes. The only real difference is that some asteroids have a stable orbit, and they tend to be made of heavier elements than comets. But, like a comet, an asteroid can be a vehicle for life forms, the location of a colony, or else a personified stellar body with its own unique existence. Rogue Planets Between the stars lie an unknown number of rogue planets, planets that don't orbit any stars and instead travel between them, sometimes getting close and sometimes staying far away. Perhaps two stars pass close enough together to destabilize a planet's orbit. Or perhaps a nebula remnant was only big enough to create a gas giant and not set off any nuclear fusion. Either way, the two main characteristics of rogue planets are that they are extremely cold and they are extremely lonely. Now because rogue planets are extremely cold, almost absolute zero in fact, you might think that they can't support any sort of life. And you'd probably be right but there are a few ways of getting around that little issue. First, you could conceive of a rogue planet whose inhabitants intentionally changed its orbit and then put themselves into a long-term hibernation state, there to remain until the planet gets close enough to a new star to thaw out, at which point its inhabitants can move into a regular orbit or else invade another life-bearing planet in the same system. Second, a rogue planet could thaw out on its own and then become the best spot in the galaxy to conduct industrial-scale fusion, without having to worry about killing local life forms or overheating the planet. That kind of rogue planet is the setup for one of Paul Anderson's Technic history stories. Nebulae While nebulae appear to be dense and colorful from a distance, the particles in a nebula are so spread out that you might not even realize you're in one. Earth might be in a nebula, at least depending on where an observer is looking from. But a diffuse nebula is boring. That's why when the video game Free Space 2 featured a nebula, they made it as thick as an atmospheric fog and full of hazards like electromagnetic storms and sensor jamming. And it is true that some nebulae are denser than others, though it's unlikely that they would get that thick before coalescing into a star system. Anyway, aside from being a navigational obstacle, you could also use a thick nebula to hide deep space predators that attack spaceships the way that fantasy sea monsters would attack ocean-going ships. Or it could help conceal a secret pirate base. Or maybe you could have the nebula work like the Sargasso Sea, a mysterious region where forward momentum is hard to maintain and ships can get mired in the calms. Now, how exactly that happens is, of course, entirely dependent on how people move between stars in your setting. Black Holes Black holes are another type of stellar body that still hold a lot of mystery. It's hard to say exactly what happens beyond an event horizon. And while obviously we know that matter gets compacted into an incredibly small volume, the rules of reality get a little wonky since time and light don't work the way they're supposed to in a black hole. They also may or may not have a connection to wormholes, which is another theory that suggests that it may be possible to connect two distinct points in space or time with a sort of trans-dimensional bridge. So what if there was some sort of other dimensional entity out there? And black holes were either their homes or the doorways they used to enter our reality. Frank Long explores this sort of dimensional being in The Hounds of Tindalos, in which a man is endlessly pursued by dog-like monsters that live within the angles of existence. Then there's the wormhole aliens from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, beings that exist in a realm beyond the borders of time and space and have to be taught how linear time works. So a black hole is not a place you visit exactly, so much as it is a gateway to things that live beyond the normal universe. The Intergalactic Void Stretching between galaxies is a kind of filament, a rarefied plasma that connects every galaxy to its neighbors in a web or mesh. 
Between these filaments is void, the complete absence of everything. Or so we think. What if there was something out there? Something that leaves behind no traces that a human sensor could spot. Some entity or threat that is not made of any form of matter or even energy, but is instead a creature of pure thought, or perhaps of pure malice and entropy. To paraphrase the old Nietzsche quote, when you stare too long into the abyss, the abyss may at some point start staring back at you. He wasn't talking about a literal abyss or a void, of course, but then neither are we. What we're talking about is how to use a real physical void to represent some literary void, to stand in for that gaze into nothingness, which every person should perform at least once, if they want to fully understand the scale of the universe. But out in that void lie unknown things, scary things, things that want to destroy you, or at least destroy your sense of self-importance. So while there's nothing out there in the real intergalactic void, it wouldn't be a void if there was, you can still put something out there to represent the unknown. Artificial Megastructures When I say megastructures, I don't just mean a big space station. I mean structures that start at the size of the Death Star and go up from there. Larry Niven's Ringworld is about a strip of artificial land that completely surrounds a star at the distance of Earth's orbit. The Japanese manga Blame takes place in a future where the entire solar system, at least out to Jupiter's orbit, has been built up into a single massive structure. A Dyson Sphere is a hypothetical building that could completely enclose a star so as to make full use of every bit of energy it gives off. A megastructure like one of these is going to follow the same basic design aesthetics of a space station or a starship, but the main difference is the sheer scale of everything. At one point in Blaine, the protagonist comes across a massive empty room the size of Jupiter, and the reason it's empty is because Jupiter has been processed for raw materials. Yeah, the whole planet. Everything about a structure that big is impossible. Well, that's no reason for you to cut it out of your setting. The universe is full of marvels. And while only a fraction of those marvels are theoretically habitable by humanity, the exciting thing about creating your own setting is that you get to change the rules and set them to whatever you want. Gas giant aliens? Absolutely. Comet extremophiles? Sounds plausible enough. A Dyson Sphere? Makes sense to me. So go ahead and focus your setting on whatever stellar bodies you like, because in the end, the story of your setting is far more important than the science. Thanks for joining me again for today's journey into weaving worlds. Please like, share, and subscribe because that raises my visibility here on YouTube. Check out my other stuff if you have some time, support me on Patreon if you have some money, and I hope I'll see you again for the next video.